Hugh Ainsworth, on November 22, 1963, was not planning to witness history. He was the Dallas Morning News' science and aerospace reporter, and the top thing on his agenda at that time was the burgeoning NASA space program. But on that day, President John F. Kennedy was coming to town. So like thousands of other Dallas residents, he went to Dealey Plaza to see the motorcade coming through the city. It was such a big cheering crowd that Nellie Connolly, wife of then Texas Governor John Connolly, turned and said, Mr. President, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you. Hugh estimates he was about 40 feet away when three shots were fired. At that point, the life of President Kennedy ended and the life of Hugh Ainsworth changed forever. Later that afternoon, he saw police arrest the assassin Lee Harvey Oswald at the Texas Theater in Oak Cliff. Two days later, he was there when Oswald was killed by Jack Ruby, a sight broadcast on live television to a horrified nation. Hugh has had an accomplished career outside of his stories on the JFK assassination, winning an Emmy Award and being a four-time Pulitzer Prize finalist. But legendary newsman Jim Lehrer said, despite all the talented reporters who made their name covering the Kennedy assassination, he said, quote, it was Hugh's story from day one. It's now 54 years later, and younger generations are less likely to know what happened that day. Plus, with the release of thousands of government records by the Trump administration yesterday, it's back in the news again. The old Texas School Book Depository, where Oswald fired his fatal shots, uh, that building is now the Sixth Floor Museum, which has done an excellent job of providing context for what happened that day. Stephen Fagan is the museum's curator, and we are excited to have him here to interview Hugh. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to welcome to the National College Media Convention a great reporter, Hugh Ainsworth. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here today. It is a great pleasure to share this very tiny table with my good friend Hugh Ainsworth. Uh, Hugh and I have known each other a long time, hence the intimate setting we're in here in today. Uh, I ordered a candle and a plate of spaghetti, which I hope will be delivered at some point during the run of this keynote. Um, but seriously though, Hugh is a recognized resource on the Kennedy assassination, a very good friend uh, to the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza. How many of you have been to the Sixth Floor Museum? Excellent, excellent. I'm glad to see that. We are in the former Texas School Book Depository Building, 411 Elm Street. If you have a chance to see it, it really is an opportunity to step back in time and explore the moment and the memory of the assassination. Uh, we welcome more than 420,000 people every year, and it really is a, a, a balanced perspective on, uh, on the assassination, the aftermath, and the impact that this had on the nation and the world. Now, of course, we're here today to talk about the Kennedy assassination, but Hugh has done many other things in his career. And right now, here in October of 2017, we are marking the 55th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis, one of the most significant moments of President Kennedy's brief time in the White House. And what many of you probably don't know is that Hugh was in Cuba in 1962, just before the Missile Crisis. So I'd like to start there today Hugh, give us a sense of what that was like. Cuba, 1962, under Fidel Castro. What are your memories of that experience? Well, I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> so I was uh, covering space. Space program at that time in the United States was probably the most, the wildest, most important thing journalistically that there was. And I'd been to Cape Canaveral several times. and. I was, at that time, we didn't know what Castro was. We knew that he was our hero when he overthrew Batista, but we didn't know then he became a communist. So we, we feared him and hated him. So I, I felt I wanted to go to Cuba and, uh, and see what was going on. Travel, I knew I could get a old truck. You know, they, even then they had trucks that they, 20 years old, it looked better than the ones we buy here today. 
but I, I just wanted to go see what was going on and drive around the island, and, and, and I did. You, uh, you got to meet Fidel Castro. Tell us about that. That was the strangest thing. We were staying in a hotel and playing basketball on the court outside. Suddenly, here comes Castro up in the Jeep with his driver, and he said, could I play with you all? And we said, oh, sure, sure, I guess, I guess so. You know? And I thought it was great, because I, I was sure then I could interview him. I was sure that he, you know, we, we'd made friends here and, and bumped a few rebounds, and I, I figured that he certainly would acquiesce to an interview. And he said, oh, yes, he said, call so-and-so tomorrow. And come by, yeah, oh, yeah. And then he eluded me. I never saw him again. <laughs> but that's life, you know. <laughs> life of a reporter. Right. Very few people, if, if anyone really in this room, has firsthand memories of that Cuban Missile Crisis, those tense 13 days in October when we were on the brink of nuclear war. And yet I imagine everyone in this room has thought about the threat of nuclear war within the last couple of months. Hugh, you lived through that experience. You saw uh, President Kennedy and how he handled that situation. What lessons can we learn here in 2017 about the way President Kennedy handled that very tense moment in history? Well, I think that uh, although there were some mistakes made up and down the line, I think that both Khrushchev and Kennedy handled it very, very well. But I, I worry today because I don't know that some of our government officials have the tact and the resources and the, the, the ability to, to handle anything like this. And we live in a very dangerous world, and I'm very fearful of what could happen just like that. Well, things certainly happen in an instant, and just a year after the Cuban Missile Crisis here in Dallas, uh, 20th century American history changed forever with the assassination of President Kennedy. You were the science and aviation reporter for the Dallas Morning News. You didn't have an assignment that day, but the day before, uh, city editor John King asked you to go check out some folks that might be protesting Kennedy. So give us a sense of, of the political atmosphere at the time. Well, Dallas at that time had a large group of people. I called them haters because they were. They hated Kennedy because, partially because he was Catholic, partially because he was a Democrat. And it was, the mood in the city was very, very harsh, very mean. And there were people all over calling the newspaper, saying they were going to do something, protest. And we didn't know the extent of it at all. So I remember they asked me to go out, interview some of the people that were most vocal. And what they were doing, they were gonna threaten him at the trademark where Kennedy was supposed to speak. And they were gonna throw tomatoes at him and jeer him and stuff like that. I came back to the paper and I said, look, I don't think we ought to do a story because that'll, that'll just add a bunch more kooks to the crowd. So we did not write that story. And so take us back. Dealey Plaza, you're standing there at Elm and Houston uh, at that juncture. First of all, why did you choose that particular vantage point uh, to see the parade that day? Well, the Dallas News, where I worked, is only four blocks away from the depository building. And I tried to get in crowds along Main Street, but they were seven and eight deep in most places. I just couldn't see. And, and I wasn't assigned to anything having to do with Kennedy that day. And I was a little upset because people would come by and have coffee in the morning at the news cafeteria and they say, well, I'm going, I'll am going. i be at Love Field. They would say, well, I'm going, to, I'm going over there by the depository building or I'm going out here. And I felt a little left out because here I was a decent reporter and I had no assignment on the biggest story in a long time. So I just decided to go over and see. And I couldn't get close enough right close to the news. So that's why I kept going a little bit north toward the depository building. And finally, I saw two lawyers that I knew. And I walked and watched with them. 
Uh, we all remember President and Mrs. Kennedy from, from photographs, from color photographs, black and white photographs, from black and white news coverage. You had that moment, you had that glimpse of them in real life, in living color. What was it like to see the president in person that day? Well, it was particularly exciting to see the Kennedys because I anticipated that there would be some really meanness along the way. And I'll tell you, the haters stayed home that day, except for the one. But uh, as they came down, they were, they were just so happy and they were so pleased at the reception, and I was too. I was really proud of it. And then all of a sudden, I hear what I think is a motorcycle backfire. But it wasn't, that was the first shot. And then soon, a few seconds, second shot and a third. Now I know that there are people that have sworn they heard 11 shots, but honestly, there were only three. And they were spaced fairly close together. And I didn't know what to do. I, I didn't know what had happened. People started screaming. People started throwing their kids down and covering them, protecting them. Some tried to run, but we didn't know where to run. Because here you had buildings on two sides, open spaces, on the others, and we didn't know where the shots were coming from. I knew almost immediately that they were shots, but nobody knew what to do. And I remember I didn't have a pencil or paper, so I was quite a reporter. What was I to do, you know? <laughs> Don't ever find yourself in that spot. Anyway, I saw a little boy had a, one of these big pencils with an American flag on it. His daddy was holding him up high, and I went over and jerked it out of his hand, and gave him two quarters, and went on and started interviewing people. And, and, and what did you use for paper? Well, I had two, uh, reached to a back pocket, and I had two utility bills that I hadn't paid. <laughs> and thank goodness I hadn't, because that's what I wrote on that day. So it was, it was really... Uh, Touch and go, nobody knew what was going on. So with your utility bills and your, your jumbo flag pencil, where, <laughs> where are you going at this point? Where is the story taking you? Well, had I looked up, had I looked, I was in the middle of Elm Street, had I looked up at that window, at two o'clock I could have seen him in the window. But I didn't, because over here, I was attracted by a man that kept pointing up there and screaming, he's up there, he's up there. This was the man that really saw Oswald in the window. And uh, later he was scared to death. But he, uh, he described Oswald so perfectly. He missed his age by a year or two, missed his weight by maybe 10 pounds. But that's where the all points bulletin came from, was that worker. And uh, later he told me he apologized for what he did. When he found out I was a reporter, he called two policemen over to have me physically removed from him. Well, that, that was even a break, because then I, I started interviewing people around the depository building. And then a few minutes later, I hear this, this police radio on a motorcycle unit saying there's an officer been shot, giving the location. And I thought, my God, what, what else can happen, you know? And I thought, if there's a policeman killed, and I knew this was four miles approximately away, cops killed here, the president shot here, and we didn't know his the seriousness of that at that time. But I thought, this must be connected. So how do I get to where the cop was shot? I didn't have my car, it was four blocks away to Dallas News. I finally found a, a television unit with two guys that I knew, and I said, did you hear what just came over that police radio? And they said, no. And I told them, and they said, get in. And we drove like maniacs over to the scene of the Tippett killing. And uh, fortunately, we got there in time to, I probably interviewed six, maybe seven people who either saw Oswald shoot him saw Oswald approaching, saw him throw bullets, 
shells away and then where he ran afterward. So it was, it was very fortunate and very lucky. And then you spend the next little bit kind of wandering all over Oak Cliff, riding around Oak Cliff, because there is an active search for the man who shot Officer J.D. Tippett, and it takes you to some interesting places. Tell us about the journey you ended up taking that ultimately led to the Texas Theater. Well, you know, we didn't know where Oswald had gone. We had two or three different descriptions of how he went this way or how he paused there and then went that way. Uh, one place that they said he might be was a, was a furniture store. Now this was not a sales store, this was a, where they, where they shot, kept old furniture, storage facility. It was an old two-story house. So I remember running in there when I found out about that. And you know, with me were six or eight cops. And uh, it, was, it was old, it was dusty, it was dirty, and, and everybody was anticipating that he was in there, whoever the shooter was. Well, one cop came from the back of that, that place and fell through the, the upstairs floor. And as he did, he hollered, Arr! and everybody around me did too. Arr! And I looked around and everybody, six or eight cops I could see that had entered that place, all had their guns out. And I noticed I didn't have one. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I thought I better get the hell out of here. You know? so, so in those days, there were no cell phones and you had to stay close to a police radio if you were doing anything having to do with police activity. And as I came out of that place, I lucked out again. I saw an FBI agent that I had known. He, had, he was halfway out of his car, his radio blaring, and they were announcing the suspect in the Texas theater. And I thought, my God, how lucky can I be today, you know? But I was tired, I hadn't eaten breakfast, I drank too far too much coffee. And I, I just, but I had to get to the Texas Theater. And so in addition to witnessing the assassination of President Kennedy, there about 80, 80 to 90 minutes later, you're there at the Texas Theater Oak Cliff to witness firsthand the arrest of Lee Harvey Oswald. Tell us about that. That was really strange. I remember running up to the theater and by that time, there was a crowd of people because I, I guess a, there was some radio reports that there was a suspect in the Texas theater. I remember I asked the stupidest question I asked all day. I walked up to the woman who was selling tickets there at the time, and uh, Julia Postal, and I said, did he buy a ticket? <laughs> and she looked at me with contempt and said, he's in there, he's in there, it's, everything's in there. And that was a strange thing, too. And you really had a hero there. A guy named Johnny Brewer was manager of a shoe store four doors away from that theater. And he noticed Oswald. Cars, police cars were cruising by, screaming sirens everywhere. Nobody knew what, what was going on or how many people were involved in anything. And he noticed that Oswald, every time a police car would go by, he would sort of hide in front of his shoe store. So when Oswald left then, the police had obviously driven somewhere else. He watched Oswald walk the four blocks, or the four stores, to the theater and enter. And he knew the Julia Postal, the ticket person. So he ran up to her and said, did you see that guy? Did he buy a ticket? Did he, he questioned her and she said, I don't know, I don't know, but I, he's in there. Well, by that time, I was just coming up onto that. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know whether they had somebody that they had a suspect inside the theater. But I went inside the door and when you go in that theater, and it's still there, you can see it. First door to the right, and then there's another door after that. 
I went to the first door, and almost immediately I saw people coming up, policemen, a couple of them were uniformed, a couple were not, coming up the two aisles and stopping a couple of people and checking them out and everything like that. We'll see. They, Johnny Brewer, in the meantime, and, and this is why I think he was a hero, because not only did he notice Oswald, or nobody else did, but he was behind the curtain telling the cops who had come in the back way where Oswald was sitting. So the cops were stopping other people, I guess so they thought the suspect wouldn't get up and, and run or shoot or whatever. But I got there just, I don't know how many minutes before, but not many. And suddenly they came from both aisles and jumped on Oswald. And I was close enough, I was probably 15 feet away because he was just two rows from the back of the theater. And I remember him saying twice, I protest this police brutality. Well, they were pretty brutal with him. They slung him down and they covered him, but he tried to kill a cop. He still had a, a gun, a pistol, and he tried to fire it. Somebody got their fingers or their hand in the mechanism and stopped it from firing, which saved the life of Officer McDonald. Now, as Oswald is being led out of a theater, out of the theater, by this time there's a crowd of more than a hundred people surrounding there, and they're chanting and they're screaming. Hugh, did you get the sense that these people were doing that because they thought this is the man that killed the Dallas police officer, or this is the man that killed the president? Well, it was hard to know what they thought, but uh, I know most of them knew that somebody had killed a cop a few blocks away. Okay, so Oswald's been arrested. He's on his way to Dallas Police Headquarters. Where does the story take you now? Well, I had to go, I had to find out where Oswald lived. And to this day, I don't remember where I got the information, but I found out where he lived on Beckley Street in this little rooming house. And I went there and interviewed the lady that ran the place and uh, I, I told her I'd need to see the room. She said he had a little room back here. I think it was something like eight by 11. Had a bed, had a dresser, a couple other hassocks and things like that. And I thought it was something, he might have left something. The only thing was left, and the police had already been there. The only thing was left was a banana peel in the waste basket. And as I was about to leave, she said, well, let me show you something. She took me back to the registry book that Oswald had signed. And he, I think his name was O.H. O. Lee, and he signed. And she tried to give me that page. Anyway, I told her I thought that the police obviously would want that page. And she said, well, if you don't want it, <laughs> I'll let you get a drink here. Um, I know you spent some time at Dallas Police Headquarters that weekend, and the Warren Commission later estimated that more than 300 members of uh, the world press, local, national, international journalists, all descended largely to one floor in Dallas Police Headquarters. Give me a sense of that controlled chaos. What was unfolding around you at, at po the police station? Well, really, I wasn't at the police station that much because I got with my buddy Larry Grove and we decided we needed to know how Oswald got from the depository building to his rooming house where he picked up the pistol to the Tiffet scene and to the theater. So we spent the next day and a half, two days, figuring that out, time-wise, who he ran into, and everything like that. But uh, the way Oswald got out of there, he came out the front door. And uh, in fact, he ran into a friend of ours who was asking for a phone, Pierce Allman. But anyway, he comes out the door, he walks four blocks up Elm Street, and he gets on a bus. This bus would have taken him right by his rooming house. But the bus got stalled. 
So Oswald gets off. He just doesn't get off wholly. He gets a transfer, which I don't know why he did that. But anyway, he walks four blocks south to the bus station where he gets a taxi cab and he goes to Oak Cliff to his rooming house. The, whole, the, the situation here is nobody knew for a day or two. We had to get that escape route. So Larry Grove and I, Larry Grove and I did that. Five days afterward, we had a big story in the Dallas News, minute by minute, where he went, who he ran into, interviewing the cab driver, bus driver. I do want to talk about some of the fa fantastic uh, and legendary investigative work that you and, and Larry Grove did in the aftermath, but there's one, there's one detail that we're missing. In addition to witnessing the assassination and witnessing the arrest of Lee Harvey Oswald, you were there at police headquarters Sunday morning and you witnessed Jack Ruby shooting Lee Harvey Oswald. So let's, let's, let's hear your uh, take on that as well. Gee, I'd forgotten about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you something. I talk to school groups all the time and sometimes I mention individual personal stories and I told Hugh's story one time to a group of youngsters and one, one boy at the back of the room raised his hand and he, he said, so he, he was there at the assassination and he was there when Oswald was caught and he was there when Oswald was shot? Don't you think that's a little suspicious? <laughs> and I do, so I'd like you to clear things up for us. Well, that weekend, there were all kinds of threats made. They, were, they have to move Oswald now. He's in, he's in the city jail. And the, the, the way they do, they move him into the county jail where he'll be held until trial, ostensibly. So, Larry Grove and I had finished up our minute by minute, street by street account of where all he went. And I kept hearing, I kept getting phone calls from people saying, so and so said they're going to kill Oswald. There were threats made everywhere that they were going to kill Oswald. So when I got up Sunday morning, found out they had not moved him yet, I ran like the devil for the city hall and the police department. Now, I wasn't assigned to this either. I'm just an interloper, you see. <laughs> anyway, I got down there just a very few minutes before they moved Oswald. I was probably 15 feet away, and I didn't see the actual shooting because in those days, the TV cameras were huge. They had these huge, and they would be bumping they were knocking everybody out of the way to get to that scene. And it was probably a full minute before I could see what was going on. But I had known Ruby, and I, I was surprised, but not too much. Because he was a show-off. He was a self-promoter. Every time in Dallas in those days, if there was a big fire, if there was a big police raid, Anything that happened, Ruby run to that scene. And then he'd run to the newspapers and the radio stations and tell them what he'd seen and say, I'm Jack Ruby and let me tell you what I saw. So I wasn't surprised it was Jack Ruby. Now, during the course of, of, and this very quickly becomes your story, you become the Kennedy assassination guy just sort of by default because you were at all these locations. And in the process, you really got the FBI mad at you a couple of times. They bugged your phone and all sorts of things. And one of the things they were so upset about is you broke the story of Oswald's uh, historic diary. Tell us a little bit about this. Well, we, at that time, there were only about nine U.S. citizens who had defected to Russia. So... The fact that he had been in Russia, we didn't know much about him at all, and, but he was suspected of being sent here by the Russians. So I started digging around and I finally found that there was, he had kept a diary when he came out of Russia. He had defected and he didn't like it there either. So on, the, on his way back to the United States, he wrote a pretty lengthy diary. 
Well, I couldn't imagine where that was, who had that. And I tried talking to his widow, Marina, and she lied about it, said she didn't know it existed at first. But finally, Larry Grove and I came up with that diary, and then I knew that I had to call people who were mentioned in the diary. There were a lot of Russians. He made some friends in Russia. And I remember going to uh, SMU where there was a Russian speaking, a Russian who taught Russian there. And uh, his name was Mamontov. And I got him to help me. And we made phone calls to, to a lot of people in Russia to talk about Oswald. And pretty soon, we, we put it together pretty well. And we had this massive story in the Dallas Morning News about his Russian diary, what he had written, his thoughts, his problems. He tried to commit suicide there once. Anyway, that made Marina very mad because she thought it was hers. And I told her, I said, you know, this is history. So the FBI didn't know how I got it. They came and asked me where I got the Russian diary. I said, well, I'm not about to tell you that people would be hurt. People, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you a thing. So they sort of, a couple of them got a little mean and said, well, you'll tell us. We have ways, we have ways, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, I got to thinking, uh, to, to sort of trick them a little bit, called my wife and I said, they're going to come down here tomorrow morning again, and they've threatened to arrest me. I'm going to call you and say something you won't understand, but just you say, well, I hope not, or okay, and then hang up. So I got on the phone thinking that certainly they were bugging me, and I said, boy, I hope that Mr. Shanklin doesn't get in trouble for slipping me that diary. Mr. Shanklin was head of the FBI here. <laughs> and so the next day, here comes these two agents, and they're saying, can we readily assume that uh, no member of the FBI uh, gave you or helped you get that diary? I said, you can't assume anything. I'm not telling you a thing, you know? So that was touch and go for a while. Later we made friends for a while. So much has been said and written and debated about the role of the, the FBI and the CIA in the aftermath of the assassination. So many researchers saying there was complicity in the assassination, that the government actively plotted the death of President Kennedy. Uh, what has come out, and this actually relates to some of the records that were uh, released yesterday, the, a small portion of which most of those records were released years and years ago, but, but there is this uh, belief that more and more people are subscribing to that it wasn't complicity in the assassination, but the FBI and the CIA to a degree deliberately withheld information from the Warren Commission investigation. They were trying to sort of um, you know, cover their assets to make sure that uh, they didn't get in trouble for revealing that they knew too much about Oswald ahead of the assassination. I want to get your, your take on that, the idea of a conspiracy to assassinate the president by these organizations versus a benign cover-up in the aftermath just trying to withhold information uh, for their own benefit. Well, I think that uh, if you look back at this day and age of that time, rather, they, they were almost like keystone cops in many respects. They, they weren't as, quite as good investigators or, or, or people that we expected to do certain things. And, and they were so embarrassed by this. For instance, when Oswald went to Mexico City four or five weeks before he shot Mr. Kennedy, he, he visited with the Russians and the Cubans both, trying to get a visa to either Moscow or Havana. And uh, apparently he wasn't, well, they, they, they wouldn't do it. Uh, one of them told him, well, uh, make this application. We'll let you know in three months. Well, he, wouldn't, he didn't want that. He wanted to get either to Cuba or Russia. And uh, 
he'd, be, he'd spoken and passed out pamphlets, as you've probably seen, uh, favoring uh, Cuban Castro. But uh, it, it, was, it was a strange time. They actually lost him. The CIA had those places bugged in Mexico City. They knew who he visited with, including some Russian and Cuban spy people. They knew that, and yet they, they lost him somehow for two or three days. Didn't know what, what happened to him. I guess they found out later he came back to Dallas. But no, it, it, was, it was just a strange situation. So in light of some of this information that's coming to light about the FBI, you know, the FBI had interviewed Oswald before the assassination. Uh, host, Jim Hostie had, had gone out and visited with him. Do you think it's conceivable that had these agencies been more forthcoming, shared their information with the Secret Service, with the Dallas police, was something like the Kennedy assassination preventable? Well, I think certainly had the CIA shared even with the FBI, everything that they knew, the FBI knew of Oswald, knew where he worked, and he wasn't a subject of the investigation. Marina, his wife, was. The Russians had a, deal, had a situation where they often planted spies in various countries, and they'd, they'd live as normal people, everyone thought, for years, and then suddenly they would use them. And they, they were, FBI particularly, was thinking maybe Marina was one of those planted agents. So Jim Hosty, the FBI agent, was assigned to interview her. He interviewed her twice in November of that year. And in that doing so, found out where Oswald was working on the parade route. He, he never interviewed Oswald himself. But what happened was this, after he visited with Oswald's wife, she told Lee Harvey, he went to the FBI and left a threatening note. And it said, leave my wife alone. We don't know what it said because it was destroyed. But it, the essence was, from the three or four people that told me they'd seen it, you know, leave my wife alone, or. I'm going to do something to you. Other people say well, he threatened to blow up the FBI. I don't believe that at all. But he did. He was so angry that he actually physically went to the FBI and left this note. Well, I was one of the two reporters that broke that story later, too. And that got the FBI after me again. And... Uh, <laughs> The FBI agent in charge, Jim Hosty, hated my guts because the FBI turned on him. He had done nothing wrong. He had interviewed Marina. He didn't, uh, he didn't know of the Mexico City stuff at all. He knew nothing about it. In fact, he was eating lunch three or four blocks away from where Oswald shot, not knowing at all. Now, if, if anyone would have told the Dallas police the Secret Service, or anybody else that Oswald was on that parade route, I think they had sat on his lap. I want to I want to talk a little bit about the idea of Lee Harvey Oswald as the lone gunman versus the idea of a conspiracy, whether it was two people or a hundred people. Before I ask you, I want to ask the audience, would you raise your hand if you think there was a conspiracy to assassinate President Kennedy? All right. Well, I'm thinking what maybe I two thirds. I would have more. Yeah, yeah, about about two thirds of this this very large audience. So, Hugh, this is a story which you've chased this story for 54 years, and as I like to say, the story's chased you back. Uh, give us a sense. You've interviewed hundreds of people. You've written a couple books on the assassination. What do you think? Was there a conspiracy at all? I do not believe there's any evidence of a conspiracy. Now, who do you think would be pleased, happy, thrilled to break a story of a conspiracy? Of all the people that you've ever heard of in the news business, who do you think would love to do that? I can assure you it's me. <laughs> and uh, there is no conclusive evidence at all. 
What it does, it embarrasses people. The FBI is embarrassed. They treated the agent Hosty terribly. They transferred him out of here to Kansas City. This man had nine children. His fellow workers thought so highly of him that they got together and bought his house because financially he was ruined. He later got into some of the FBI files when he was on another assignment and found out how they had done this to him. And it was J. Edgar Hoover, who was not a very nice man. <laughs> and he helped ruin this man's life. Now, you have, in addition to interviewing eyewitnesses, police officers, individuals involved in the actual story, you've also talked to a fair number of researchers and book authors. Uh, I want to ask you about a couple of those that are the most prominent. Mark Lane from New York was probably the first of the real uh, high-profile critics. He wrote the book Rush to Judgment, which uh, was for many people their first exposure to the idea of a conspiracy in the assassination. You met Mark and, uh, and had some run-ins with him. Tell us a little bit about Mark Lane. Mark Lane was a lawyer from New York City who was a one-term congressman in New York. The, uh, I guess maybe the second week after the assassination, he wrote a, he wrote a story in a, in a leftist magazine forget what observer, I'm not sure what it was, but that there was a conspiracy. Now, and he called me shortly afterward and he said, well, I've seen some of the stuff you've written and I need to talk to you. So I said, sure, come out to my house. So uh, sometime within the month of the assassination, Mark Lane came to my house and I sat down with him and told him, he, he would say, well, so-and-so did this, and I said, no, no, they didn't do that. So-and-so was over here, he wasn't there. So-and-so knew this. I said, no, he couldn't have, because he wasn't there. And this went on, and finally he kept saying, well, how do you know? Now, in the other room in my office, I had somewhere between 70 and 80 affidavits of people who were witnesses to various things that weekend. Nobody else had them, and I've never told anybody where or how I got them, but these, these were people who were witnesses to various things, to the depository area, and the tip of the killing and all. And uh, I got tired of talking to Lane, and Lane kept saying, well, I'm going to meet with Mama Oswald tomorrow. I'm going to become his lawyer, and we're going to get fair fair trial for Lee Harvey. I said, look, I think he should have his day in court. No doubt about that. But you're wrong about this. You're wrong about that. He kept saying, well, how do you know? So I went to the back room in my office, and I brought out these 70 to 80 affidavits, witnesses that were talked to that weekend, and I threw him down on the desk, and I said, now, you said this, read this. Now, these had not been made public at all, and he was amazed. He said, my God. He said, how did you get these? I said, I'm not going to tell you that. And so he said, well, could I take these? I'm forming this committee to give Oswald representation. Could I take these back? And we didn't have Xerox machines everywhere then, I can assure you. And uh, I, as, as a fool, let him take those to New York. Said he'd get them back in a week. He, I couldn't find him. Couldn't even, his phone wasn't connected after a week. First thing I got word of where he was, I got a call from a, a very famous historian in London. And he said, pardon me, he said, I want to congratulate you on stealing all those materials from, from the Dallas police. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, Mark Lane told me you stole those 
from the Dallas police. I said, no, I didn't. What, how do you know Mark Lane? He said, well, he's here in London starting up who killed Kennedy committees, raising money. And I said, my God. And we didn't end up friends, but. So that's, that's, that's Mark Lane. He made up evidence. He made up interviews that he never did. And he just was nothing but a lying opportunist. And his book was the first important book about conspiracy. Back in 1991, filmmaker Oliver Stone made the movie JFK, which I'm assuming many of you in this audience have probably seen. It might have been your first exposure to the assassination story. And in it, uh, Stone uses as his all-American protagonist the New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison. Now, Hugh, you knew and spoke with the real Jim Garrison back in the 60s. I think you were with Newsweek by this point. Uh, tell us a little bit about Garrison's investigation and what he was like as a person versus the image of Garrison played by Kevin Costner in the Stone film. Well, I liked Costner, but Garrison was something else. I got this call, I, I don't know when it was, it was probably, probably January of 67, because I had just joined Newsweek. And he said, oh, you said, uh, read about you everywhere. You, you were here, you were there. And he said, I, I want to share information with you. I have an investigation going on about who really killed the president. And he come on over and I'll show you everything that my investigation. And then I need to, I need to talk to you about several people and things. So I called Newsweek and asked the editor, I said, should I go? He said, for God's sakes, why aren't you there now? <laughs> so I go to New Orleans. I go to Garrison's house. He didn't want to, he said, if you come to the office, everyone will see us. Well, I thought that was a little unusual for a district attorney, but so I go to his house, walk in, and he's got all kinds of pictures of everything connected with Dallas that you could imagine. And he started telling me, he said, well, now, this is where the Dallas police planted those bullets, right here. And this is what I, I said, no, Jim, that's not where it is at all. They, they weren't there. This is who picked those up. And, you know, I was correcting him. After three or four times, he got a little angry. And I thought, shut up, you. You better shut. You need to know what this guy's doing. So I didn't interrupt him anymore. Pretty soon off to the one side of the den there where we were, he gets a phone call. He goes in and excuses himself. And I hear him in there, he's saying, well, no, damn it, tiger three and, and, and <laughs> hippopotamus four. And, and I'm thinking, what in the world is he doing in there? Well, he comes out and I didn't say anything about it because I was afraid once again that I had, I, too much I had, ridiculed his thinking, so I better shut up. And then it comes the second call, same thing. Tiger one, no, damn it, he hangs up again. Well, this time I couldn't resist. So I said, Jim, I couldn't help but over here. What in the world is all that, that tiger, this? And he said, that's an old Navy code. He says, the, the effing Phoebes will never figure it out. That was my first meeting with Garrison, and it was one of the most bizarre, but it wasn't the end. Because every month, he came up with a new suspect, a new witness. For a long time, I kept getting calls from a Mexican jail. And this woman said, well, Jim Garrison told me to call you. And I said, well, tell me what, why? <laughs> She said, well, I saw Lyndon Johnson pass money to Lee Harvey Oswald down in this valley, Texas Valley. And I said, well, you know, I, I'm not going to say no. I said, tell me more, because that would be one hell of a story. And I found out later, through he dumped her. He had a new major witness every three months. And for two years, 
His publicity went on, pro-Garrison, pro-Garrison. Mark Lane came down to help. I'm trying to think that there was a comedian, I forget who it was. He, no, it was, uh, well, anyway, came to his house, knocked on his door and told, said, Mr. Harrison, you're wonderful. I want to work with you. And, and it was this type of thing. Everybody thought for the first time, somebody's doing something about the real facts, except that Jim Garrison never had a real fact, period. There was a speculation at one point where the shot might have not come from the back, but might have come from the culvert area. At one time, this is when I was still being rather quiet and in sort of good graces with Garrison. And Jim said, well, we figured it out. We've got this guy that came out of the culvert, and we, we know who the little man was. And I, somehow I just said to myself, this is so ridiculous. I said, Jim, do you know that that culvert is only 14 inches wide? And how could a man get down in there and shoot somebody? And I remember him saying, well, you, you don't understand that there's a lot of little men in America and some of them are madder than hell. And you know, you, you see something like this, you hear something like this, you think one time, maybe you didn't even hear right. But I heard probably 15 different things like that. And then finally, I wrote in Newsweek that they were bribing witnesses, they were making up stories, and that it was just a complete hoax. And the conspiracy was all of Jim Garrison's making. So many people, though, to this present day, believe in a conspiracy. I mean, we have uh, statistics in the museum going right up to the 50th anniversary in 2013. It seems like from about the mid-60s on, the average, uh, the percentage of Americans that believe in a conspiracy has ranged from anywhere from 60% all the way up to 85%. Are all of these people just missing something? Uh, in other words, what is the reason that people so want to believe in a conspiracy here? Well, really, I think everybody loves a conspiracy. I remember when I was growing up, the best show on radio was The Squeaking Door, and I Love a Mystery was the name of it. Man, you just sit there and you were just captivated by it. People love a mystery. It's more fun. And often it's true. In this case, however it is. Is there any aspect of the assassination, and you've looked at pretty much everything, is there one aspect that still eludes you? Anything where you think there is something to be found that has not been found yet? Well, there are a lot of explanations of people that uh, tell certain stories, some of which may be true, but I, I don't see any second gunman. I never, never have come close to that. And I know it's, I understand we love mysteries. And look at politics today. I mean, you can't turn on the television and see anything covered that is pushed to the left or the right. And it, it's a very dangerous situation, I think, but, but I do understand it. Hugh, you, you, you covered the assassination of Martin Luther King. You covered the Branch Davidian situation down in Waco. You covered the Oklahoma City bombing in 95. So many historic events, uh, cultural touchstones for many of us in this room, our first Kennedy assassination experience, perhaps. Is this the story? Is the death of the president, is it the story of your career? Is it the one that uh, you are most proud of covering? Well, it's, it's caused me the most difficulty in covering, that's for sure. Uh, a lot of the conspiracy people whose livelihood depends on there being a conspiracy have attacked me and claimed I was a CIA agent. And one time my son came up to me and said, well, Dad, I saw on the internet that you were a CIA. Did you get a, a pension when you left? And I don't know, it's just, it, it's, it's been fun in a way, but it's been 
54 years of, of consternation and, and a, lot of, a lot of work and a lot of heat. I remember I was in Austin at a book conference and a guy came out of the crowd, very, very authoritative, authoritative, said, I know you were with the CIA. And I know when you joined and I know what you did. And you did this in Cuba. And, and I said, I started to answer him and, and the moderator said, no, that's not, not fair. We're not gonna get into that. And I said, yeah, let him talk, let me explain. And I explained to him that the only contact I ever had in my life with the CIA was one time when I wanted to go to Cuba and you couldn't deal with the Cubans so I had to go through the Czechoslovakian embassy and ask for a visa and I did. I was with the Dallas News then and I didn't hear a thing for months. Then one day I get a phone call from a guy who says he's Mr. Smith and you're going to Cuba. And I said, well, how do you know? And who are you? Who are you with? And he said, I'm the local man for the CIA here in Dallas. I didn't know they had an office here. I'd never met anybody with the CIA. He said, now you're going to Cuba. I know you are. We have sources. <laughs> and he said, now you're going to take cameras and stuff, and you're going to you need to take pictures of this and the other. I said, wait, hold on. You know, I'm a good American. When I come back, I'll tell you everything I know, everything I've seen, and anything I shot. But I'm not going under the aegis of the CIA because they could kill my butt real fast. <laughs> he said, okay, and he hung up. I thought that was the end of it. I'd never talked to a CIA man, ever. He wrote to his superior in Washington, very few words, I don't recall exactly, but in essence it said, Ainsworth's gonna help us when he gets to Cuba. So now all the conspiracy people who distrust me, me, <laughs> have said, see, that proves he's with the CIA. And I told the crowd, I said, look, I've been in this business all these years, over 50 at that time. And I said, never in my life have I ever taken a penny from any governmental agency, nor will I. And I said, wait, I have one, one I made a mistake. I once was paid to travel to the FBI Academy to make a speech. That is the only time, and I have never met a CIA man to this day. All right, that kind of brings us full circle, actually. We have microphones uh, on these two rows here if you'd like to ask Mr. Ainsworth a question uh, while we're waiting for someone to, to get up. Hugh, I've heard you say you're really tired of this story after all these years. Is that true? Do you feel this burden of history? Well, it's probably why I lost my voice. You know. <laughs> All right, several, several folks. We'll, we'll go ahead and start with you, sir. <clears throat> Is this thing on? Hello. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jonathan Garcia, and I'm from Del Mar College at Corpus Christi, Texas. And um, I was wondering, basically, when you covered the, um, you, well, you were covering a different story before you found out about JFK's assassination and stuff, but when did you know that this was going to change your life forever exactly? I really didn't know it was going to change my life forever, though it did. But I had a pretty good clue that weekend after that weekend. Uh, okay. Hmm. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Colin Anderson. I'm uh, with the Avion newspaper from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida. <clears throat> uh, my question is, uh, switching off of the Kennedy assassination, uh, what was it like covering uh, NASA and the in the aerospace industry? Because I, I mean, I'm an aerospace engineering major. Um, what was it like covering that uh, back in its heyday, back in the '60s when it was first starting? Well, I, the covering the space flight was really exciting. It was the most exciting thing going on in the country, I thought, at the time. Uh, interrupted only by the Bay of Pigs problems. 
But no, it uh, it was it was the Dallas Morning News was one of the very few newspapers that covered every flight. And I was at the Cape Cape Canaveral then uh, a lot, many times. Got to know all the first and second and third group of astronauts, and it, it was it was really exciting. Hey, uh, thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Maddie Keith. I'm from the University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, I was wondering, with all the conspiracies that were coming out around the, the Kennedy assassination, but also with all the different events that you've covered, uh, the Martin Luther King assassination, uh, Oklahoma City bombings, how do you keep above the fray uh, in terms of the conspiracy theories? How do you make sure that you're reporting objectively uh, just the facts and not start conforming to, to hearsay and rumors? Well, I think if you're in the news business, you know the difference in fact and, and imagination. And I think that I learned early on that sometimes it's tougher to deal only with the facts. Much more fun to believe in the right things that are more conspiratorial. But I just think you have to be honest with, you, with yourself. I intended to be in this a long time, and I have been. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Becca Carlson, and I'm out of Pensacola, the Corsair. Um, basically, I know you said that there's no conspiracy that, the, um, that our government or anybody actively um, participated in an assassination. However, you also said that the, these authorities lost track of him. These very equipped and well-trained authorities lost track of him for three days, and he ends up in Dallas. Uh, would you say that there was any inclination that a conspiracy to do nothing and let it and allow it to happen? And how does that lead us in the future with our relationship between journalism and our government? Well, that's a, that's a wide question there. <laughs> I, I tried to I fit two know. in. <laughs> I'm a little concerned with the government versus press right now. We're, we're seeing everyone's dealing with all kinds of fake stories and claiming fake stories and journalism has been hurt. But I, I don't know, I think one thing that we, we learn as we go along, I used to think FBI guy, oh my God, they couldn't make a mistake. You know, they, they wouldn't lie. I've known some that did. I just like Dallas police, Fort Worth police, whatever. They're just human beings. Sometimes they make mistakes and they, they characterize things differently and that's a danger too. I've known, there are all kinds of people that you run into in this business over a lengthy period of time. And some of them are good people, most of them are. Some are just liars and, and they take advantage of their situation. And I've run into some of those too. But I'm worried about our press versus politics right now, very much so. Please help me thank Stephen Fagan and especially Hugh Rainbow. <laughs>